The Chelsea Arts Balls were for many years arguably the most famous party in the world, certainly the most famous fancy dress party in the world. Uh, for their origins you have to go back to the late 19th century uh, and to the studios and art students of Paris. Uh, it was in 1892 I think that the Belle des Quatre Arts was first held in Paris which was a really wild affair which was a step up from the parties that had always been held in artist studios. Uh, the next year things happened on an even bigger scale. In 1893 there was famously a ball at the Moulin Rouge. The founders of the Chelsea Arts Club were meanwhile busy getting their club off the ground. A lot of them had studied in Paris and they brought the habit of wild fancy dress parties back to London. So there were lots of such parties uh, in the 1890s. And in the early 1900s the newly founded club decided to hold a ball in what was then called the Vestry Hall. We know it as the Old Town Hall today. In the middle of the 1900s the Old Town Hall was built, slightly paradoxically, as the front of the Vestry Hall was pulled down. The artists of the Chelsea Arts Club, uh, deprived of the use of the Vestry Hall, cast around for a new venue and in 1908 held a ball in the Opera House in Covent Garden. It was an absolutely huge success and became what the balls were subsequently to continue to be, which was a big social event attended by a lot of socialites, actors, etc. It was such a success that in 1910 they looked for an even bigger venue and hired the Royal Albert Hall. And from 1910 until 1958, every year, apart from the two world wars, the Chelsea Arts Ball was held at the Royal Albert Hall. Artists certainly know how to party. Um, there were lots of creative elements to the Chelsea Arts Ball uh, and one very interesting social element. Um, creatively, um, you start with the fancy dress. You're absolutely right that artists love dressing up and each year the ball would have a theme. They were held not religiously at midsummer as, as we do now. We hold them at midsummer and, and on New Year's Eve now. Back in the day, there were some on New Year's Eve, there were some at midsummer. Quite often they were on Mardi Gras uh, at the start of Lent on Shrove Tuesday. Uh, carnival, farewell to meet. Uh, and they were absolutely wild affairs. As I say, they were always given a theme and those attending would dress either to the theme or frankly just in any fancy dress they could think of. So that was the first element of creativity and there were about four or five thousand people at these balls. Uh, these were the days before modern health and safety regulations and they absolutely packed the so-called great floor of the Albert Hall and filled the boxes uh, around the dance floor. So 5,000 people in fancy dress and the hall itself was in fancy dress. Each year one of the artist members of the club, usually a very distinguished one, often a Royal Academician, would be chosen to design the theme for the ball. Uh, he'd paint a painting, it was always a he I'm afraid, uh, he'd paint a painting and then the scenic artists of the club would turn that into a huge backcloth uh, for use in the hall. The third creative element came in as the years went past, which was the practice of the art schools of London producing a parade of floats, or what were known as stunts, at midnight. At midnight, this big cavalcade of artistic chariots would roll onto the floor of the Albert Hall and the watching crowd would cheer and admire them. But I'm afraid what then happened is that another habit grew up, which was that the various art schools decided that they were going to destroy each other's floats. And so what inevitably happened as the parade progressed was something of a riot. Uh, and that riot got worse and worse during the 1950s. And finally, in 1958, quite understandably, the Albert Hall had had enough. And I'm afraid we got kicked out for rowdy behaviour. If you go to the Albert Hall now and walk round its oval corridors, you see memorials of all the wonderful things that have happened in the hall over the years. There's a picture of Frank Sinatra in concert, another one of Shirley Bassey and so on. And then you come to a picture of a Chelsea Arts Ball and underneath it says, the Chelsea Arts Ball, which was held here every year from 1910 to 1958, when it was thrown out for rowdy behaviour. Luckily, the Albert Hall doesn't seem to have held a grudge. Uh, I can attest to that for two reasons. One is that actually on three occasions in the 80s and early 90s, uh, 
we held our ball back at the Albert Hall again. In fact, at one of those balls, Laurie Lee, a staunch member, was found asleep at 6 a.m. in the morning uh, in the dustbin outside the stage door. Uh, he'd obviously had a good night. Uh, the other reason I know the Albert Hall um, hasn't lost faith in us, as it were, is that when they inaugurated their Pavement of the Stars recently, amongst the first stars awarded, which went to the likes of Eric Clapton and Roger Daltrey and Shirley Bassey, there was one awarded to the Chelsea Arts Balls. Uh, and if you go to the pavement outside the Albert Hall uh, in front of the Royal Entrance, you'll see our star in the pavement there. We're very proud of that. And we do harbour an ambition, perhaps, to stage a Chelsea Arts Ball at the Albert Hall again one day. One of the remarkable things about the Chelsea Arts Balls as artist balls was that they were thoroughly bohemian in every way. And one of the things that was splendid about them, and we're very proud of, uh, is that they were very, very liberal affairs. They were, for instance, one of the few public events in London for many years where one could be openly gay. There have been many, many ball themes over the years, themes like Arabian Nights, Sun Worship, goodness knows what. Perhaps the most famous ball of all time was the ball in 1919. It was just after the First World War. The world had been through an extraordinary trauma. And of course, to the trauma of war, was added a second trauma, which we're now newly sympathetic to, the trauma of the Spanish flu pandemic, which had killed so many people across the world. So come March 1919, how appropriately to have a party whilst paying some respect to what the world had been through was a very difficult question. Uh, the solution that the artists of the Chelsea Arts Club came up with was a rather brilliant one, I think. It was to make the theme of the 1919 ball dazzle camouflage. Dazzle was the extraordinary geometric camouflage that had been painted in black and white zigzags onto the world's warships during the First World War. It was designed to confuse hostile observers and it produced an extraordinary modernist effect. Picasso claimed that it was Cubism that had inspired Dazzle. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that's true. But it may well be the case that Dazzle, in fact, was an inspiration to some of the geometric modernists who followed. What is undoubtedly true is that Dazzle was invented by an artist, uh, Norman Wilkinson, uh, whose grandson, I'm delighted to say, is a member of the Chelsea Arts Club today. So in picking Dazzle camouflage as the theme of the ball, uh, the Chelsea Arts Club members had both hit on a way of commemorating the war, but also picking up the distinctively artistic contribution to the defence of the realm. And of course, they'd come up with a wonderful theme for costumes because black and white zigzags made for really spectacular outfits. Having been kicked out of the Albert Hall for rowdy behaviour, the club now holds its balls uh, on its own premises and anything up to 400 revellers at midsummer and rather fewer on New Year's Eve continue to don a fancy dress. The themes these days are as extraordinary as they always have been. Uh, in recent years we've had a trompe l'oeil ball, we've had a space ball, uh, we've had all sorts of extraordinary designs that have transformed the interior of the club uh, on the tradition of the Albert Hall interiors and members continue to don fancy dress and it's probably true to say that these days members are rather more assiduous about matching their dress to the theme than they used to be back in the past. One of the other habits that we formed is to paint the facade of the club to match the theme of the ball. So twice a year our white, low, rather anonymous facade in Old Church Street is absolutely transformed. Uh, in the run-up to New Year and in the run-up to Midsummer, taxis stop, passers-by take photographs and one of the great sights of London blossoms. Uh, our facade has been called one of the great public art projects of London and we're proud to think of that perhaps being the case.